Hello friends and viewers, this is Asvardul, and welcome to a brand new edition of my game development live stream. Today the game that we're working on is Sarah the Shield Mage, a side-scrolling uh, puzzle platformer with some RPG elements. And uh, where I wanted to start with you all today was I wanted to go ahead and start with some of the feedback I got on my prototype. Uh, first I have to thank the Game Jolt and Unity communities both. Um, uh, part of the feedback was to slow down the physics, which I did. I also uh, got some new music in the game. Um, I also took the feedback to make the blocks last a little longer so that, whoa, crap, so that you could actually get across the uh, Hall of Spikes here. So, yeah, as you can see, it is a lot easier to do now. Um, in light of some of those changes, you have a little bit more control over the uh, puzzle platformer aspect. Um, some more things, I actually implemented the uh, treasure chest reward. I got a uh, item get theme in here. I was briefly working on the sprites. I, ha I had an 8 frame animation going on, but it, the animation itself was just way, way, way too slow. Uh, I also did redid the um, the UI up here. I changed the icon to be a little bit more uh, a little bit more descriptive of what the spell does, and um, people seemed a little bit um, more likely to realize that you could get on the spikes, but they really felt that the uh, controls uh, got in their way. So I'm uh, working on some of the issues that. The testers experience gonna probably have another uh, build of this prototype out um, probably in the middle of the week again I'm thinking uh, prototype Wednesday is totally a thing at this point so um, yeah that's what I've been working on um, let's see something else you can do you can also uh, stack blocks yeah so if you have both mana charges you can get up here pretty easily but yeah this is just pretty, pretty much this is just a test level. So yeah, with that, um, yeah, that's everything I've been working on up to this point. Um, it's it's sort of been a slow week. I had some great uh, feedback on the Unity forums too. Uh, definite shout outs to both Angry Penguin and Mr. Selmo. Uh, they both gave me some great design advice. Um, I'd actually lost thread of uh, some, actually some of the point of uh, testing, and um, they did a they did a really good job of reminding me. You know, the point of testing is to to suss out errors and not necessarily to find um, new features. And that was something that I'd briefly forgotten and hit a brief bit of, and hit a bit of confusion about. So. Uh, Definitely shout outs to both of them, and that's something for you all who are watching who want to write your own games to remember. Um, don't do not do an Esvardul and forget that. That's very, very, very important. Right, so now that we're done with that, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and get to um, part one of the main attraction. Um, yeah, one of the things I said I was going to do uh, this week was the unfortunate, boring... Um, story design document stuff and well yeah pretty much I have to uh, I had an earlier I had a basic version of this actually um, written out a little bit earlier in the week but I wound up dropping it because it wasn't really what I wanted to do I've actually started um, restarted this and I've settled on a slightly different structure originally I was just going to go through the standard uh, Hero's Journey, the Meta Myth, whatever you want to call it. But I also really liked what was done in uh, Chrono Trigger, really. Um, Chrono Trigger has a very, very interesting structure if you actually look at the game. It's done more like a, a, a style in the ancient Greek theater called the Tragedy of the Entity and the Comedy of the Sages. And for what I want to achieve... That's actually really what I want to do, I think. Um, I, I want Sarah the Shield Mage to be about Sarah the Shield Mage. I mean, that's, that's sort of the point. Where the hero's journey is a game about taking a journey and adventuring through a land 
this game is a little different altogether. It's all about this main character, and I realized I just forgot something. We need some characters. Right, so, um... The first character, of course, is Sarah, the, uh, Sarah Brandinson. Um, she's the player character. Um, she's going to be a surrogate for part of the game. Um, the whole point of Sarah Brandinson um, is to, on the one hand, yet yeah, to be moved around by the player and actually um, used to achieve some of the objectives of the game, but uh, ultimately she's the only one who will be able to defeat the primary antagonist. Um, definitely saving the world is definitely a thing. This is in the tradition of most JRPGs where, hey, your mission is to save the world. Really, let's face it. What else, what other story hook is really going to keep people interested? I mean, in theory, you could write an RPG about going to Taco Bell and eating a taco, but, you know, how interesting is that going to be? I mean, do you have to fight a legion of monsters to get to your car? Do you have to defeat a world boss to obtain said taco? You know, I mean, it, it, it's, one, it's one of those things that... A lot of people, I feel, get onto RPGs for being too formulaic and not having enough diversity in their objectives. But really, I mean, other than saving the world, what's going to get pe what's going to get people to travel all around the world, meet every different civilization in this vastly simplified world, and do all these things? Other than saving the world, I mean, there has to be some uh, some proportionality to what what we're asking the player to do. Um, definitely Sarah Brandinson. Um, she's she's the player character. Um, I think what, I think what I really want out of Sarah as a character. She's the one who's gonna. She's uh, the hero in the standard sense. Uh, she's uh, destined to defeat the uh, the true antagonist of the game. Uh, that's that's sort of important, um, but I also want to throw some spanners in the works while I'm at, while I'm at this too. I I don't want this to be just boring and formulaic either. Um, I one of the things again going back to Chrono Trigger that I really liked was that the the player character winds up dying. Uh, part way through the story, I think at about the three about the three quarters mark. Um, I really want to move that up, and I want I want the main character to die. And the reason for that is partially it's the structure of the thing, the tragedy of the entity. What usually happens in this structure is that this theoretical entity uh, is retelling its story using the characters that you have at hand as a surrogate. Um, after all these events happen, tragedy strikes, um, it's a repeat of what the planet, or what I say the planet in reference to Chrono Trigger, of what the entity has been going through. But then, after the tragedy has struck, after the characters have seen what this high-level uh, high abstract entity has been experiencing, then there is intervention. The sages intervene. They, they give the remaining heroes tools with which to avert the destruction and ultimately create a comedy, a happy ending, uh, out of this craziness. The way they do that in Chrono Trigger is they force the player to go through every single timeline and sort of sh be showing the player at any given moment how Lavos has been screwing with everything. And then Chrono, Chrono being killed by Lavos in the Ocean Palace, it's sort of the capstone to that. But after that sort of darkest day on the Blackbird, it turns around, and all of a sudden, Belthazar, uh, Melchior, and Gaspar's gifts wind up actually uh, turning out to help the player not only revive Chrono, 
not only patch up the loose ends in uh, each of the characters' own timelines, but ultimately defeat Lavos. And that's that's a happy ending right there. I mean, yeah, you've saved the world, you've saved your buddy who got vaporized by a giant tick from outer space. You know, that's that's powerful. That's really powerful. And that's something that I would love to be able to capture in uh, in Sarah the Shield Mage, because this is all about... In, in the end, this game's all about Sarah. All roads lead to Sarah. So, um... Yeah, she's the... She's, uh... Whoa, I realize I made a major typo. Yeah, she's, she's destined to defeat the true antagonist of the game. Um... She'll die as part of the tragedy of the entity. So what's going to happen at a very high level is we're going to wind up writing a tragedy that the world of this game has been experiencing. And Sarah is going to embody that struggle. Every early success, every dungeon cleared, every every great moment where she's actually managed to fulfill her oath and protect people is it's ultimately going to all be in service of illustrating to the player you know this is what the planet has gone through or i say the planet this is what maybe the goddess maybe the planet maybe <sighs> i don't know and that's uh, one of the things that you know I wanted to I also wanted to get feedback on too because it's so easy to just uh, you know play uh, one of my big uh, gripes that I have it's so easy to play the religion card look at lightning returns final fantasy 13 I mean they are extremely heavy-handed when it comes to all things religion and uh, that that bothers me I mean that that doesn't seem like tasteful storytelling I mean yeah you would want a world to have faith structures uh, one of the things that people tend to do is want to believe in something higher you know um, whether or not that's your um, persuasion in life it's beyond me to say but it's something that people do we wouldn't have so many religions if we didn't and that's something that we can use to help players um, to help players relate to this game world, I believe. So um, whether or not the religion needs to be real, like whether or not like the god or goddess or whatever it is has to be a real entity, that's highly, highly questionable. I think. Um, I'm just going to keep what I have there. Because something else I liked about Chrono Trigger is it's, it's in a way, it's a very deceptive game during the tragedy of the entity. It has a lot of red herrings. But if you go back and you play through the game a second time and you know what's going to happen... Everything that like the NPCs say has a completely different meaning, like when you first go to Medina Village. Um, and to that end, I want to create a red herring enemy who's going to be a playable character in the early part of the comedy. That's very important, too. I, I really want the player to feel that they've lost Sarah, and then this character is going to... To need to go on a quest to reclaim her. I mean, she is the important other piece to this entire puzzle. Um, yeah, the the concept I had was a guy named Davis. I'll just add some spaces for his last name. Why not? Um, I'm going to, I'm, yeah, he's definitely going to be a red herring. Um, what I'm thinking is that his goal aligns with Sarah's in, in a sort of abstract way. Um, 
this is actually something I wanted to get into too. Uh, one of the things that I was thinking of is that, you know, the reason Sarah is a master of shield magic is uh, she had some traumatic event in her childhood that led her to want to protect people. Um, that's the order of the luminescent shield. There we go. Yeah. That's how we're going that's I think the way to do this. You know, she something happened that was really bad. She wanted to protect people. She wound up joining up with this order of of shield mages, the order of the luminescent shield. They taught her the basics of shield magic. And then uh for the tut the tutorial level, the easing in of the game, uh, what's going to happen is we're going to be providing a relatively safe environment that was originally intended to maybe be part of her initiation or some something that would have been normal but will be a good way for her to learn how to properly use uh, shield magic. And th that's sort of how my hook is going to be there. Um, the interesting thing, though, is that now where Davis comes in is I really want Davis to be in that very first scene. You know, I, I want to deceive, I actually do want to deceive the players in this case. Uh, what I see that buying for us is we're, we're trying to keep the player on the seat, on the edge of their seat. We want them to be engrossed, certainly. But we also want we want something that seems clear and formulaic at first, but we also want there to be pieces that do not make a whole lot of sense. Uh, yeah, Davis is of course going to have his own sprite and animations because he's going to be playable. Um, we could even have him as like a tutorial uh, a tutorial boss, really, uh, just to teach Sarah how to properly uh, attack an enemy with summon block or whatever. But the thing is, um, uh, his goals run parallel to Sarah's. And that involves uh, keeping the true antagonist uh, uh, sealed but his way of doing things is an offensive way of doing things. Uh, he's we we could give him an alternate. Um, we can make him a part of a knightly order or something. It's almost I would say like a knight templar or something. But you know something something very aggressive. Um, I think when we were building Sarah's sprite, we made sure she had like a lot of armor and blue. Um, we can make Sarah, Davis could maybe be like a. Uh, could have a whole lot of red in his character design, maybe some gold, um, a very flashy, outgoing personality where Sarah is uh, protected and defensive a little bit. Um, actually, that'd be a great... We could make his... Um, his last name have to do with that color. Um, actually, my, my own middle name is Russell, so... Can name Davis Russhelm. He'll be he'll be redheaded. He'll be he'll be aggressive. He'll seem to be antagonistic. He won't understand why this why this young girl is stopping him from doing something that in theory could save everyone concerned a whole heck of a lot of a trouble, but wouldn't necessarily be good for a game. And I think that would be a great way to start the. Um, Actually, that would be a great way to frame the story. What if the true antagonist is on screen during the very first uh, during that tutorial level? You know, what if what if the what if the true bad guy has really been there all along? That would be something, wouldn't it?
I think that would. I think that would add a real that would be a real gut punch when it comes to the scene where uh Sarah does finally get killed off, I think. Um prior to getting revived because you know this game is sort of about her, so she's totally coming back. Um Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking that's how we're going to do this for Davis. Um, but I also think that it's a good idea that we that, that we give him a key. I mean, he needs to be a key part of this, too. Uh, Sarah can't really save the world without Davis. That's what the, the JRPG convention is at its core. JRPGs are about the group working together to solve problems as opposed to an American RPG which is the individual hero going forth and doing heroic things like the Tales of Yore. Um, he needs to be important. Sarah may be the one who's destined to, uh, to destroy the, the true antagonist, but Davis ultimately let me let me think of let me think about this what I originally had in my first draft of this was that Sarah would have you know the the standard Zelda three to seven approach where you go through your first three noob dungeons to get pieces of something you unite them and it leads to this awesome thing. Oh, cool, Crystalline Entertainment. Uh, yeah, def uh, definitely feel free to be back in about 45 minutes. I might be doing music then, but yeah, you can always um, give me some tips. Uh, I, I would definitely appreciate them. I hope you have a good dinner, too. Uh, thank yeah, thanks for popping in, too. Yeah, so I'm thinking Davis, in his little part of the game, he's he's going to be the hero. And in the in the end game too, he's uh, sort of gonna be. He's gonna be there too. You know that might be an interesting idea, sort of a character swapping mechanic where you can just sort of tag out at at the end of the, at the end of the game where you can swap between Sarah's shield magic, or Davis's uh, high speed sword play. That'd be a really cool mechanic. And. It would allow me to get some, some a possible low-level romance going too, and that that would be very good um, for for female players. One of the things, one of the bits of guidance that I've received is that um, is that the ladies tend to like uh, you know well-dressed, powerful women, but also some some romance to uh, flesh out the characters. And really, even being a guy, I don't mind a good love. I don't mind a good love subplot every once in a while provided it's not overdone I think that would help I think that would help a lot um, yeah so he's going to be uh, the main character for the uh, opening of the comedy of the sages um, specifically his quest is going to be to revive Sarah, is to resurrect Sarah. I think that's a that's a good place to uh, to leave his character for the time being. But we also we need a villain, you know. That's that's another problem. All what Sarah and Davis are trying to solve is a problem. That's the whole point of heroes. Something has to create those problems, so we need a we need a villain. We need an antagonist. We need something that is working counter to what Sarah and Davis wish to achieve. And fortunately, because of the fact that you know this is a RPG esque video game, 
we need it to be world threatening if if the villain does what he wants to do world is screwed you know that's sort of how that goes but what do we want the villain to be that's a that's a good question uh, i want the villain to be there in the very first scene I'm actually sort of drawing a blank on this one. Because there's so many ways you could take a villain. You know, you could have an evil sorcerer. You could have a dragon if you wanted to go the Skyrim approach. You could have an uh, angry god. Well, destroying god is such a... It's that, it's that lightning returns thing again, you know? I'm not really I'm not really happy with, you know, oh destroy a god, yeah, that's totally a thing, yeah. No, it's it's totally not, you know. Um so it's, it's way overdone, in my opinion. You could have you could sort of go the Zelda route where you have an ancient force of, you know, just domination. And that that's kind of interesting. I feel that's a little overdone too, because you know there's always the sealed evil in a can. It's there's a reason it's a cliche that you know the evil could be sealed a thousand years and is going to break out. You know on the one thousand mark on schedule, absolutely. Insert other JRPG cliches here. But what would You know what what do we want to to contrast the theme here is protecting others and sort of the another another sub theme is that you know the st standard rpg formula where your characters are cutting a swath across all of the land is it's just unworkable you know yeah you you could and in many games you do but you you'd just be over at some point reality would have to ensue you'd just be over you'd be overrun or you'd be you'd become this sort of just blood knight who's so used to fighting that you don't really do anything else you know that's a great thought though um fallen heroes are a thing Fallen heroes are definitely a thing. And playing against the standard JRPG formula, it's kind of interesting. It's kind of interesting. So what if we were just to say that the ancient sealed force of darkness was a fallen hero whose solution was to ultimately destroy everything his companions or either his companions or another group of people with similar interests got wind of his nihilistic vision um, and just as he was gaining the power to do what he wanted to do they sealed him but they knew the seal would wouldn't stand forever they knew eventually he would break three the seal, the seal would uh, wane and that he was going to be a problem. So they left things like the discoveries of shield magic and a way to actually fight this guy so that he could either be permanently defeated or resealed or whatever. They, the thing is, everyone knows... That's a, I think that's a great thing right there in the, uh, the situation. Let's, let's start with that. So, uh, so, 
So a thousand years ago, a fallen hero was attempting to complete a ritual which had given the power to s destroy the world. Some um, other heroes of the time uh, found found out and uh, and sealed him before he could uh, he could destroy the world. The thing is, they knew he they knew the uh, they knew the seal wouldn't stand forever, so they left. They, they left techniques and equipment and items and things that they had used all over the world in order to be able to fight this guy and either reseal him or destroy them. And that's a great way to lampshade all the crap lying around in chests around the world. That is That actually factors into a video game plot very nicely. And, um, yeah, the fallen hero, he's going to be, he's totally going to be a character. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, but that leaves the question of, you know, who's going to lead into him, you know, Obviously, having a t a thousand year old. Actually, no, you know that's that's not a bad idea. Having a one thousand year old hero who is very nearly back to full power. Um, that's actually kind of intriguing because you know you have this hero who's come back. He's looking around this world, and we can give this. We can make him a true plot villain and not just a mechanics villain. We can give him a little bit of depth. Um. Yeah, at the start of the game, his seal is fu is fully broken, but he's looking around. So the, but the question is, of course, being a villain, you know, why does he want to destroy the world? What makes this villain get out of bed in the morning and go, yay, destroy the world mode, you know? He is, he has something he wants. He believes, this fallen hero believes he has the answers to something. And he believes his answer is the, on, is the only workable answer. And he's a little too okay with actually going through with it. That's what makes him a villain, an antagonist, something who's, instead of working to protect, he's working to destroy, you know. He probably is going to have a certain degree of mental illness in that regard. He's going to, the, the, the fallen hero has taken so many wrong turns he's not even in the right universe, you know? And that's... But there needs to be something... As, as part of the tragedy of the entity, that's the thing. Uh, the fallen hero's journey needs to mirror Davis Russhelm. These two are linked. Closely. If Davis had taken two or three wrong turns in his journey, he would be this guy. And it wouldn't matter if the fallen hero would be destroyed because next the world would have to seal Davis and this you start getting into this cyclical plot like you see in Final Fantasy games. Um. That's very important. What's going to make Davis a hero and whoever this guy was a villain is going to be a matter of 
a couple of choices, you know. Do you do you cross the Godzilla threshold and and do something horrible? Um now there's a few directions we could go with this. I'm thinking that you see I don't know I'm thinking a lot out loud um Well, first, what do we want to call the fallen, the fallen hero? I think that's an important thing. Let's let's give him a name. Let's stop calling him the fallen hero. Let's give him. Let's make him a man. Let's let's stop him from being a myth. You know what? Who is the fallen hero? How? Um, what were they? How do we? That's how we can approach it. Oh, it's a good name for a fallen hero. Not Mythos, that's taken. Um, not Chandler, that's a character from Friends. I didn't actually have a name for the fallen hero prior to this by the way Dave, Davis and Sarah were were well thought of advanced this guy totally isn't that's why I'm stonewalling right now uh, let's see something something that has to do with a color is a little bit too uh, too obvious like noir or um, Yeah, that's Noir was uh, the main villain in Half Minute Hero, by the way. Um, well, when in doubt, we can always go to the Google. Google is good. You can always uh, ask history. Um, Villain names. Uh, fantasy name generator. Sure, why not? I actually didn't know there was such a thing as a uh, fantasy name generator. Let's see. Uh, Captain Secret. What the? Okay. Proud Wiz, the Nifty Ant, the Frozen Assassin. Crimson Wing. Ooh, that could be interesting. Because I want Davis to be associated with the color red. Okay. So now, now we're getting somewhere. That's a, it's a good theme. Crimson Wings. Let's add that. Master of the Crimson Wings. So let's let's get a sinister language like German, and let's uh, uh, English to German. So. Uh, So Crimson Flügel is Crimson Wings in German. And that's not going to be very... Well, Flügel might be. I know what to do. Russ Flügel.
Sir Ross Flugel, the master of the Crimson Wings. There we go. We have a villain. We can make him Sir Mark Ross Flugel. There we go. That's that's a person. That's not a legend. That is a actual uh, villain. He he was a knight, similar to Davis. Very important. Yes, I I think we've got a good start on a true villain for this game. Something this game needs, unless you want your game to be Final Fantasy X-2. <sighs> I can't take that game seriously, I'm sorry. But yeah. Got a player character, we've got a red herring antagonist who's going to be a player character. We've got a true antagonist of the game. We've got a lampshade for why there's items, powerful magical items, just lying around in the game world. They're going to be suitably hidden, yes, but they're, they're going to be accessible. The first Crimson Knight. There we go. We'll go with that. Color color Knighthood. There we go. So he'll be a red knight. Crimson Knight. Great swordsman, just like Davis. And his and the problem he was trying to solve was a massive world war, I guess. Hey, Crystal, welcome back. Yeah, I've finally settled on a name for the uh, true antagonist of the game, Sir Mark Rossflugel, the master of the Crimson Wings, or the fallen hero. Um, I, I wound up using a Google villain generator to get him and then uh, chose a sinister language. Um, I went with German to, uh, to produce our uh, handy little... Uh, our handy little villain there. Um, I, it's sort of necessary for the purposes of the tragedy that he, his story parallels Davis, but that Davis ultimately makes um, makes diverging choices at key points so that he doesn't become a new um, a new fallen hero who has to get sealed by everyone else, and that you know. Davis can be a playable character who's who's worth people's time and energy. Um, yeah, yeah. As far as the pro as far as like the problem that Ross Flugel was trying to solve, I'll have to I'll have to figure that out. But you know, it has to be one of those things where in his time, you know, it it was either. To him, at least, it was cross the Godzilla threshold or everything or existence becomes a living hell. You know, that's that's sort of how the villain has to see it. But the villain has, by necessity, has to be short sighted and choose the wrong things. Anyways, it's nearly 9.15 p.m. Uh, Central Time. So, you know, this is 45 minutes. I'm going to keep on uh, pounding away at this in my own time during the week. And yeah, Crystal, I'm probably going to get back to you about, you know, about some tips on characters and arcs and that sort of thing because I'm I'm not a writer, I'm a programmer. And I feel that writing right now is actually one of my weaker skills. So, I, I really appreciate you uh offering to uh to help me out with that. That's that's really nice of you. Thank you very much. Um if you Want to see something that I'm not absolutely horrible at, though? Let me go ahead and save this and close.
and close. Let's write some music. Let me go ahead and get my uh, whole setup uh, ready to go here. Uh, pretty much the way I wind up writing music is I start off by writing it in MIDI and then um, and then generate a augvorbis file that I then process. So uh, this might be interesting. Now, uh, one of the things that I'm trying to do, since a lot of my um, a lot of my art style is derived from medieval sources is I am actually using in this game a Dorian uh, musical mode so instead of being do re mi fa sol la ti do it's actually re mi fa sol la ti do re instead which leads to a very sort of uh, medieval sound for the for the places where I want them um, now if you want to hear something interesting temple of the goddess um, like I said, I do I do want, you know, that divinity to play a part in the comedy of the sages, but well, uh well, that's noble house from the I was going to I was actually going to write a house theme tonight and that might be a good idea. Just something kind of light and uh upbeat. But yeah, this is what I've got for the temple of the goddess. All right, and that's it. Yeah, so it's sort of a, uh, it's for the most part a choral piece, but we've also got sort of a secondary theme going on. Uh, I went ahead and stuck with that sort of very medieval sounding, you know, Dorian mode. It's definitely a uh, a sacred theme, you know, it's very, I wouldn't say it's necessarily happy, but yeah oh you oh you like that that's good that's good um yeah and that's why i love the dorian mode um there's a, there's many more modes out there yeah i say many actually there are many more modes um there's some very interesting ones like um the phrygian mode that's one of my favorite you uh hear phrygian in uh specifically in spanish music a whole lot but you know that's not really the uh, theme I'm going for in this game but uh yeah tell you what let's create a new song I'm I'm thinking this is gonna be good so first thing um, I'm gonna call this uh, in the house just because it's gonna be a house theme you know uh, we're gonna try let's see Toxic Ether, yeah, Ionian is the standard major scale, and Aeolian is the uh, standard minor scale. Um, there are some some variations, but yeah, I was a music minor in school, so uh, I've I'm not the most knowledgeable in music theory of anyone you've probably ever met, but I might know more than most programmers. Um, so yeah. Right, so in the house, you know, we want something that's sort of, that it's definitely uh, a major, it's going to be on, founded on a major scale. It's going to be very happy. I'm probably going to do something like uh, E major. Um, it's going to be that sort of bum, 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 bum. You know that that's no that's the Zelda house theme. I'm not gonna do that. You know that would that would be all sorts of um, all sorts of bad. Um, let's 
go ahead and start with some pizzicato strings. We need a bass. Okay, so I'm thinking we're going to do E minor, so it's going to be... Yeah, I'm going to start with something like... Yeah, that's... It doesn't sound like much, but it's going to be a, a real... It's gonna be it's gonna be goofy, it's gonna be happy, it's going to take sort of that re mi fa so re mi fa la so me and it's gonna just make it awesome. Um lots of triplet snares? No. I I, I could, but is that such a I don't think that's a good idea. Now uh crystalline, yeah, um 2D pixel graphics, it, it takes practice. That part takes practice. Um, music is an entirely different skill set, I found. Uh, when I was going through my music classes in college, sometimes it was like my professors and it was, uh, was, very, was very, I don't know, it sounded like they were speaking a different language some days, if I'm totally honest. Yeah, it's sort of a, uh, it is sort of marchy. Actually, you know what? I moved away from this. Let me show you what I wrote for for the heroes. It never made it into the hero's journey, but um, this is what I had before, I think. No, that's what I actually have in the game. Noble House, there we go. Okay, that's enough. But you can sort of see the style that I'm going for. I have that sort of that goofy, um, that sort of goofy bouncing theme. It's in a house. It's happy. It takes them. It takes sort of the uh, evil castle theme. You know that, and then just goes completely goofy with it. You know, it, it's lighthearted. It's a safe environment, and that's the point of the music in this case. It's to to reinforce to the player that hey you're in a safe place feel free to jump around mess around talk to NPCs um, all all those things that you do in a safe place um, see crystalline entertainment says uh, do do electronic music as a hobby very nice uh, Commercial structured music is totally different than doing game music. Yeah, that's actually the sense I got from when I was a music minor, because I had some friends who were composition majors, and sort of the way I do game track. Even back when I was younger, with the, the way I did game tracks versus the way they wrote actual music, music-y music compositions, uh, yeah, it was... Sometimes it was like they were speaking a different language, and by that point, I actually knew enough to understand some of what they said. Um, yeah, so I'm thinking for our our version of In the House, um, I'm going to start with this sort of goofy Oompa Oompa setup, but then, it, it, at least in, yeah, I'm definitely doing that all throughout. Um, I probably want to do something that's like a one four five one pattern maybe actually I think I'm getting ahead of myself we need a melody melodies are good no want to move that one down String ensemble. That's what I was looking for. Now the MIDI, uh, the MIDI samples aren't going to be really awesome. 
but well, they don't have to be. I'm going to be rendering them as sound fonts anyhow. So, bum 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 ba da, bum 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 ba da. Um, what would be a good melody? Actually, that sounds really good. Uh, so toxic Ether. A sound font is a series of sound samples that you can uh, that you can use to make a MIDI composition sound different. It, in other words, it's a way of not having to use your system's built-in um, built-in synthesizer to play stuff. You can do it in software instead. Uh, the software that I'm using right here, Synth Font. Uh, allows me to more easily uh, do that sort of thing. Like you notice for here that I have like a string section forte font for the soprano and alto strings. I've got a, pian a piano uh, string section for the tenor strings. I've got a French horn sound font that has a very distinctive sound. Um, Cor anglais, uh, English horns. Yeah, I mean that's, that's sort of what we have going on. So instead of sounding like general MIDI, uh, let me go ahead and save this right quick, and let me go to Noble House. So this is my MIDI, right? So yeah, that's the MIDI. Um, is it sort of like a VST instrument setup? Uh, yes and no. It's a little bit different. Um, I recommend doing your own research into it though, that, that'll help you more. This is Noble House with sound fonts. You can see we've just completely overwritten the strings, we've got English horns, we've got oboe, we got... It sounds completely... It sounds all, a lot more real, doesn't it? Yeah, and that that's sort of the difference right there. Um, and I can export to other things like MP3 and AugVorbis, and I can do post-processing, which is very important. Um, under the hood, MIDI is pretty much a programmatic way of doing music. Uh, there's, there's notes. Notes are in a certain octave and are sounding a certain tone. Notes have a duration. Notes have VST effects associated with them. It's fully possible, I think, to... Um, I think if you, you uh, knew the the format, you could uh, like either write an app to uh, to have this sort of music just handwritten. Um, with with sound fonts, you're taking that and you're render and you're rendering it out into an actual sound wave of some form. So um, yeah, sound yeah sound fonts are extremely useful. Toxic Ether. Um, it's definitely something you'd want to use. Oh yeah, if you want to know what I'm using, uh, this is a piece of donationware called Synth Font. Um, it comes with a couple of uh, sound fonts of its own that you can get started with. Uh, there's some other sound font packs out there you can buy. Um, I'm using. Let me see if I can show you the one I'm using. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm using this one here from uh, from DSK Music. It has it, it's twenty five dollars. Um, they they call it a donation. You're actually buying it, but um, I've up, actually updated some of my tracks with uh, these sound fonts instead. And it really, really winds up helping. So uh, I, I have to recommend them. Actually, I don't have to, but I still do. But right, we're not writing enough music, are we? I feel that I feel we're deficient in that regard. So I want to do something like B 
So, let's go and do that. Okay, there we go. We've got a good start there. Actually, I'm going to go a completely different way than what I just said. Uh, We're going to go Then we're going to repeat that This is going to sound horrible, by the way but usually whenever I'm writing music, oh. it sort of does the first time. Let's go ahead and drop those a second. That's kind of cool. I think we're on to something here. Not as something good, not onto something like like drugs. Drugs aren't good. Uh, strings. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna call this alto tenor for right now. I could always uh, I could always rewrite it a little bit later on. And I guess the well, let me go ahead and give this an, an instrument other than piano. That's that's a good place to start. Give it these sort of long, quiet strings instead. There you go. And it's going to go down to the seventh, which is this D, so I'm going to want to do something like that, sort of. Let me try that. No, that's too sinister. That's, uh, eh, yeah, no. Absolutely not. Way too sinister. Let's go ahead and do this. All right, there we go. Cool. You go ahead and flesh out another supporting part here. Um, the fifth can usually be omitted, but. I don't I don't know. I want the whole triad. 
Octaves might help. Um, I Okay, I'll give that a shot. Actually... Okay. Tell you what, then. Let's meld in some octaves. Actually, let's not do it there. Got a better idea. Let's go and get some legato strings in on this action. Now what I'm doing here, um, something that I tend to do when I'm writing my MIDI music, I'm going ahead and starting off with the string parts because the point of the, pretty much the, the string parts are exceptionally beautiful, but um, at least from what I've learned in instrumentation is that they have a relatively neutral timbre to them. So I can go ahead and dress what I can do is when I have a good string line established, I can go ahead and use some of my other instruments like oboes, flutes, br all the brass, percussion, and I can start decorating this core theme and really make it come alive. And that's what I really want. Also, I want to go ahead and start um, positioning the, the virtual ensemble. I'm going ahead and uh, following something closer to the standard orchestra setup where you have your uh, your treble strings uh, far on the left, your bass strings far on the right. Uh, normally your alto and tenor strings would be uh, off-center, but um, for my purposes I just have them uh, for my purposes, I just have them centered. If I go back and I split out the alto and tenor parts from each other, I would have them a little bit off center so that you get that more, uh, so you get that good orchestral sound. So let's see what we've got now. Actually, let's write something for the bass part. That's what I intended to do. My bad. Actually, that's not minor at all. That's minor. Why am I doing that? That's A. There we go. Okay. All right, we're good. Does orchestral music do that with the pan? Um, Actually, usually yes. Um, there is a very standard way of um, arranging a orchestra ensemble. Uh, I highly recommend. Uh, there, I forget the name of it now. When I was in when I was in my music courses, I knew this by heart. Uh, there was a pretty much a, a textbook on orchestration that was written by one of the uh, great Russian composers and in his textbook he talks about um, you know the things with the strings and how they relate to the ensemble he talks about uh, the various um, the various instruments and the role that they accomplish in this um, I don't know the name of the book off the top of my head and I've already done enough Googling in this broadcast uh, to to put myself to shame. But I highly recommend uh, if you have, I don't know if you're in school studying music or what, but uh, if you have a musical connection, I would ask them about the book on orchestration written by one of the, by one of the uh, great Russian composers. I bet you dollars to donuts they will direct you to it straight away. I bet you. It's it's I can tell you it is required learning. Um, the fact that I've forgotten it is due to my atrophy with those skills, unfortunately. Let's see what we got. Yeah, this chord is bothering me. No. No. Okay, so... Yeah, okay. I'm going with that. 
it's strings, so perfect octaves are okay. The only time you, I think one of the only times you don't want to do uh, fifths and octaves is when you're uh, composing for choir. Uh, the human voice is a little bit more finicky in how you write for it. But, yeah, that's a different story. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and just reprise this line. And I'm going to lead it to a, a cadence of... I'm going to lead it to a slightly more... Um, I'm actually going to hand it off to a less, even less final cadence than a perfect sec, than a, uh, than going merely up to a second. But I'm going to go ahead and keep the bass line for right now. And the tenor line. And most of the treble line. So, beetle, deedle, 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 deedle. Yeah, I think I think sort of inverting the end of the, or I, I, it's not really inverting it. Well, whatever. I think instead of going up and handing off to something else, that coming back down to the uh, to the tonic to that root chord is is sort of the way to end this sort of happy musical thought right here before I go into my reprise of the main light motif of this game. Let me go ahead and modify this. Uh, okay, there we go. And that's an imperfect, um, that's an imperfect cadence, I know. So, we can go ahead and build out another, um, another musical thought from that. But before we go too far, let's see this, how this sounds when we give it a couple of sound fonts. So this is my bass sound font right here. I'm keeping the pizzicato string one. Let's see, I'm gonna give this string section forte, string section forte, and string se section piano, my bad. There we go, let's try again. Doesn't sound as good, but we're gonna be dressing it up with stuff, so. Okay, so that's a good start. Um, actually, what I probably want to do at this point I go ahead and start making some uh, some mirrors for these string parts. I want to flush these out and sort of and sort of change the way the sound is coming to the listener. I also want some goofier instruments because even though this has a very a legato feel to it, um, let's see. Let me go ahead and add some bassoon. Bassoon is an interesting instrument in um, in orchestration. 
because it, it can resemble some just really wacky stuff. Um, bassoon can, you can either use a bassoon to like indicate like sickness or malaise. You can have a bassoon that's used, it's a woodwind instrument, so it's got a really deep, rich, woody tone. So if you want, in all the things that I have for like a wood, wood levels, I all, bassoon is like my go-to bass instrument. But you can also do some very playful things with bassoon also. And that's that's the capability that I want to uh, to play off of in this. And I think flute, clarinet, and bassoon are... A, it's a very playful combination. So we could... We can do some cool things. Now this is a little bit low for the bassoon, actually. I have to make everything staccato, and that, that would take a while. Yeah, that'd take a really long time. It's one of my few problems. Um, Oh, there is a way to make everything staccato. That's very helpful. This actually sounds like now it could be something out of Kingdom Hearts, you know that? And that's not a mistake either, actually. Uh, Yoko Shimomura, um... Some of her works led to me uh, get writing some of my first compositions. She's got a she's got a really uh, really interesting style, especially her more playful things too. Actually, uh, I'm not going to equalize those just yet. Now, clarinet is sort of a. Uh, Sort of, it can be a soprano instrument, but it's more of an alto instrument normally. So I, what I really need to do to make this playful is I need to take this this legato graceful theme, and I need to ornament it. It it needs some it needs some flair. It needs playfulness. It needs it needs dewdrops. It needs highlights. It mostly needs highlights. That's the thing. I, I usually have a rather uh, a rather darker emphasis on my compositions. I love the bass and the low part. Um, but yeah, let's let's see what we can do for this. Uh, let's see. Oh, no, no. So I'm actually going to write, I'm going to write a counterpart to this instead of being, actually, I'm going to write something just completely freaking ridiculous. And that's not all of it. It's going to be. WTF, did that just identify the keys of the tones that you sang? No, not, no, it didn't. It, it totally didn't. I don't have anything configured for me to be able to, actually, I don't even have my uh, keyboard plugged in. I'm actually doing all of this with my mouse. Um, there is nothing advanced going on in my setup right now. Trust me. Um, actually, I, what I one of the things I need to do is track down a stand. Uh, green dots. Oh, that's uh, whatever I have um, my whatever I'm mousing over. So yeah, that's just yeah where on the keyboard it is. So yeah, tr trust me. Uh, the system has not become sentient. Skynet is not helping me write music. Um, Yeah, I forgot I have that on solo. 
actually. Let me go ahead and start on a G sharp there. Don't need that half rest. And this might be better served in the flute part. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's that's one reason I try to avoid singing um, on, on and off stream. The other reason is because I'm bad at singing. Actually, I think we're on to something here, too. Let's try this. Oh, that was actually a lot better than I thought that was going to be. I think we're, I definitely think we're on to something. Uh, Crystal Entertainment, you never learn to read music formally, so you do everything on a piano roll. Um, on a music staff confuses you. I am terribly sorry then. Um, I personally, I find piano rolls incredibly confusing. Um, part of the reason that music notation is so funny um, is because it's actually an alternate method of annotating durations and keys, and it's a relative positioning system, too. Um, actually, if you look at the clefts here, like, see how this is shaped very obtrusely like a G? Well, that's because it's telling you where G is on this clef. This, the bass clef is a little bit more interesting, but if these are lines, this would produce an F, and this is telling you where F is. Um, there's other clefts out there. I'm totally not going to go into them. I'm not a music professor, but um, yeah, the the yeah, the, yeah, it's an interest. It's an interesting system. But when I actually took music history and some of the stuff coming out of the Baroque period was presented to us, um, you actually start to see like the prototypes of the modern of modern music notation uh, taking hold. Um, even in the modern day, though, there's uh, alternate notation methods. I've seen something called birdsong notation, which is, it looks like a sound wave, and it <laughs> pretty much is, but yeah, it's it, it's special. But yeah, um, let's, let's give it one more time, because I lost thread of where we were. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and do a little run the other direction. Toxic ether. It sounds like a Baroque piccolo part. Um, that's probably not a mistake either because I was an oboe player when I was in band and a lot of oboe literature is Baroque. Um, so unfortunately, I'm probably not going to be able to fix it. Um, the last time you had to read sheet music was fifth grade. Almost 15 years. Wow. Uh, I, I don't blame you. I don't know. 
I, I'm not going to go off on a diatribe on musical education, but it seems like they, in in early music, they try to dump way too much. Was that your experience too? It, nothing wrong with Baroque. <laughs> oh yeah, Toxic Ether. Um, yeah, just so, just so I clarify. Um, yeah, that that was a jo there was a it was a really cheesy musician joke I used to always hear from my uh, from my classmates. You know, um, if it ain't Baroque, don't fix it. You know, it's it's hor it's horrible. It's, I feel I feel like I've wronged you by speaking that joke. It, it's so so cheesy. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, oh, I didn't even realize it was 9.56, holy crap. Yeah, yeah, it talks together, <laughs> nice. Uh, okay, right back at me, okay, I, I, I sort of deserved it, okay. Yeah, I'm gonna keep on messing with this, though, I, I think we're on to something here, it's, it's kind of happy, it's a little broke, but, you know, that's, that's not always a bad thing, um, I can all, I'll always have to be, wait. I just noticed my balance on this is way off. Why is the bassoon all the way over there? It should be closer in. Actually, it needs to be about right there, I think. I'll have to go and, I need to go and find the name, first I need to go and find the name of that book I was recommending for you on orchestration. That's uh, sort of important for me to, because I've probably orchestrated half of my midis completely wrong. Um, just throwing that out there. Also, uh, yeah, I think I've, I think I've done a good job tonight of uh, showing off um, my music creation process. Uh, yeah, this is so far what we've done, there's a lot to it. It often takes me about two, three, four hours to write a single musical piece. Um, it, it's something that just requires a lot of work, sort of like pixel art. But yeah, I mean, I, I definitely thank you all for watching for watching this so far. Um, Crystalline Entertainment. Um, as a kid, you don't think you'd ever have a legitimate reason to use it? Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I, I really feel as a kid that learning learning the basics of your mathematics and how to properly use language and a, a little bit of logic and learning s and reading some um, some good books is a lot more useful of a pastime than um, than sheet music I mean yet yeah, some some of that sheet music knowledge should leak in if you want to learn like the ba to teach the basics of sound like knowing knowing that you know, in a, in a four four measure, there's four beats. Um, knowing that there is such a thing as a melody and a rhythm, and uh, and supporting parts, uh, learning like the basic A B A structure. Yeah, there's all sorts of useful musical knowledge to know at a young age, and some of this is gonna, some of this uh, feeds into this notation because this notation is supposed to be a shorthand to make it easier, but. <laughs> Parts of this notation ain't easy. So yeah. That's a mouthful. I'll tell you what. I've got work tomorrow, so what I'm thinking I'm gonna do is I'm going to go ahead and cut this broadcast short. Um, over the next course of next week, um, I'm gonna be working on improving my uh, prototype. I'm gonna finish off this piece of music. I'm going to do another, get another round of uh, feedback on my mechanical prototype. There were some control issues and some, um, and some feedback issues that my users had uh, commented on, and I want to get those uh, ironed out. But yeah, I definitely want to thank each and every one of you for, uh, for coming on and listening tonight. You, you've survived my bad singing, which means that you are clearly made of iron. You've, uh, you've, You've heard the horror that is a meaty when I first get started making it, and that that can't be understated either. And uh, I I really feel that y'all have given me some some good advice, uh, not only toxic ether with the music, but I think um, I think this week when I talked to uh, Crystalline Entertainment more about um, about the plot of the game, that we're gonna have some I'm gonna have some uh, some good changes to make to my sort of basic concept. 
I'm going to start fleshing out a good story, and we're going to have a pretty awesome game. So, yeah, definitely hats off to all of you. Um, and with that, there's not really much else for me to say, except that I certainly hope you all have a good night. Is there anything else you all, you all want to ask about before I, uh, before I cut off the recording for the evening? I'll go ahead and give a, give a few seconds for, so that Twitch lag is accounted for. Yeah, Toxic Ether, I am looking forward to, uh, to this, to the end result of this game. I, the Hero's Journey has been the best game I've ever written to this point, but I really feel Sarah the Shield Mage is going to be way the heck better. What is the air, average airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow? Uh, 28 miles per hour, doesn't matter if it's European or African, and yes, a scientist did take the time to uh, measure it. And my favorite color is green. And I think Antioch is the capital of Assyria. Now, if you were to ask me how much wood a woodchuck could chuck, if a woodchuck could chuck wood, I would be completely lost. So I'm not going to answer that question. They make good ho uh, I will concede that they make good holy hand grenades, Toxic Ether. Uh, if there's any advice I can give about setting up tiles in Unity for a 2D side scroller, you're still lost on that. Um, as a matter of fact, there is. Uh, woodchucks don't chuck woods. I'm thinking of a. Oh. Then that is the most deceptive joke ever written. Okay. Right. So, go into scene view and make it less ugly. Right, so uh, setting up tiles. Um, what I tend to use is Unity's built-in uh, vertex snapping. What you do is you hold down control and you move uh, fixed distances along an axis. I use that to uh, have uh, a lot finer control over how I build my levels. Um, another, another thing worth noting too is um, you do need to be aware of the size. Oh, you got a date on OkCupid with that answer. Nice. Yeah, good Good job, man. Um, another good thing to be aware of as far as the 3D tiles are aware of is the size of the tile in question. Um, when, I, when I created my custom tiles here in Unity, they imported to Unity at about a uh, two by, at a, uh, at a scale of like two units by two units, I had to scale them down so that they'd be one unit because by default, Unity's built-in vertex snapping um, moves in, um, in intervals of one unit. Um, as far as like laying out a level, there's not really a whole lot uh, to, to laying out the level itself. Um, so make sure you have something beneath your character so that your character does not fall through the world. Um, as far as like setting up physics, uh, physics are hard. You, you you saw my last episode, Crystalline Entertainment. You saw physics bite me in the bottom. You 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 sort of know how that goes. Uh, and I haven't. I still haven't fully um, figured out all the physics. I, oh yeah, I never got to show you all uh, the prototype. Because I don't think anyone was watching at that point. Yeah, so um, I uh, toned down uh, physics. So I, I'm saying I completely toned down physics. Like, this is three quarters of uh, Earth gravity. Um, I reduced Sarah's jump height uh, pretty significantly. Um, I also increased the duration of the summon blocks. So that, ow so that you could uh, get across the pit a little bit easier. Players were saying that it was way too hard to get across this. And there wasn't really a lot of uh, margin for error. But yeah, so just let the mana regenerate. But yeah, as far as um, laying out blocks, uh, 
Um, laying out blocks, there's not a whole lot. I say there's not a whole lot to it, I guess if you haven't done it a lot, and I have, um, it might be. Um, the main thing you want to be aware of is um, knowing what your player character can do. Like for instance, I know that Sarah can jump about two to two and a half uh, world blocks in a single full power jump. And uh, that's a very important thing I use to uh, create most of my puzzles, actually. So yeah, see right here, I sort of force the player to have to summon a block because I uh, uh, can't jump it, right? But if I do this, yeah, now I can jump. And this can be uh, comfortably made. Now, if I took out this block, you'd have to do like some uh, funny, funny double jump maneuver like that. And that actually might be a good idea in hindsight. Thank you for that, Crystalline. From that low angle, you can barely see the platforms against the background. Okay, that okay, that has to do with about 35 seconds ago, I guess. But yeah. Yeah, there's still things for me to work out on this. So uh yeah, I all I can say to you, Crystalline Entertainment, is um setting up tiles in Unity for a side scroller. It's as much an art as it is a science. Um You'll, what you'll probably wind up having to do is experimenting on your setup uh, to determine what works for you. Um, other than that, there's not... I don't know. I can only be so helpful. and It's not because I want to be unhelpful. It's all stuff you're keeping in mind. Um, Divining, uh, oh, divining. Designing environments and props in Photoshop and importing them into Unity as planes. Um, actually, what you want to do, um, if you're going to be doing uh, 2D stuff, you want to use a quad instead. Um, they're more, uh, perf they're more performant than a plane. Planes are naturally subdivided so that you can do uh, some more complex operations on them, like water effects. Um, Sizing and ortho camera settings are giving you a lot of trouble. Yes, yeah, uh, orthographic cameras kind of suck. They obey a completely different uh, set of rules than a perspective camera. And that's actually one reason for my graphic style is um, so that I specifically wouldn't have to deal with that. Also so that I could practice my 3D art because that's, uh, that's a place where I feel I'm a little bit deficient. Um, yeah, you definitely want to use quads for uh, 2D things. Actually, if I look at uh, Sarah right here, Sprite, ah, there we go. Yeah, you can see she is a ginormous quad, and all of her, um, yeah, all of her stuff. Uh, Toxic Ether says, orthographic should only be used for UI and truly 2D scenes. Um, so yeah, it sounds it sounds to me, Crystal, like you're doing you're you're trying to do a pure uh, 2D setup. Um, so yeah, I would go ahead and I don't know. You're you're almost certainly gonna have to do some experimentation. Uh, sort of the sort of the thing I do is if I expand my uh, directory structure over here, I sort of create uh, test scenes um, before I ever start actually producing a game. Yeah, um, yeah. Toxic Ether is completely right. Uh, the point of orth, yeah, orthographic versus perspective. Perspective has a vanishing point. Ortho does not. Um, so yeah, it it is a completely different set of rules uh, from a mathematical perspective too. So uh, yeah, I would, I I'd, I'd go ahead and experiment and um, and see what you want to do. The problem is I don't know your precise setup, so I can't give you really good in-depth advice. It's, it's just something you're going to have to mess with. Um, yeah, so before I go ahead and uh, before I turn off the broadcast for the night, is there anything else you want to know?
And before talks together asks, uh, the answer to the question of the meaning of life, the universe, and everything in it is 42. I'll give some time so that uh, Twitch's delay gets factored in. All right, talks together is good. How about you, Crystalline? Uh, oh, four twenty. Oh, talks together four twenty. Computer just got high. In oh, not eh. man. Yeah, it sounds like you need some sleep, man. I think you're good. Just have to play. Yeah, I, Crystalline, I wish I could give you better, uh, some better suggestions. Um, even doing this sort of perspective setup, I had to do quite a bit of experimentation myself. Uh, unfortunately, you just have to hit on something that winds up working, in my experience. It's, it's not the best advice I've ever given, but it's the best advice I've got. So, uh, so yeah. All right, well... It's late enough. We've all got we've all got things we have to do tomorrow. So I'll go ahead and let you guys go. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for following, subscribing. It, it's really awesome. Your support means a lot to me. Um, gonna keep on making this awesome game. And next Sunday at 8:30 p.m. Central Time, you'll get to see more of it. So uh, I really appreciate you guys. Thank you very much. Um, hope this has been of help to you. And as always, see you guys next time. Later.